Good afternoon, space flight enthusiasts. I'm coming to you from Canary Wharf in the United Kingdom in a fantastic hotel room that was uh, given to me by the uh, Marriott Company. They just gave me a ridiculously good price on this place, and they've just always been really good to me. So I just wanted to say thank you very much to the folks at Marriott in Canary Wharf. And let's go ahead and get started with this episode. I, about a week ago had an opportunity to attend the Ignite Space Conference, and during that conference I had an opportunity to interview the UK Space Agency about their commitment to Artemis and the Moon to Mars initiative, given all the changes that have been taking place recently, to see where the UK Space Agency stood on all of this and also what's been happening them with them recently, and I'll tell you, a really fantastic interview. Can't wait to share it with you. So we're going to get into this right away. Before we get going, I just want to say thank you so much to the Patreon supporters on this channel, because without your help, I wouldn't be able to attend these conferences. I wouldn't be able to conduct these interviews. I wouldn't be able to go the extra mile to bring you all of the latest on space flight as the sun comes out here, exposing all of the hidden details, shall we say, about space flight. Some of the things that the media does not report about. I think the sun's come out at exactly the right time to talk about that. So let's go ahead and get straight into this interview right now. Hey folks, we are back with the UK Space Agency once again. These folks have been so incredible in terms of providing me with access and interviews over the years with all the exciting things that they are doing lately. And sir, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Chris, Chris Whitehorn. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive of the UK Space Agency. Thanks very much. So we'll get right into it. Um, first of all, let's talk about this conference, about this uh, Ignite conference. What's what's the objective? How's it been going? How's that been working so far? Yeah, so Ignite Space, uh, several years old now. This is where we bring together the small and medium-sized enterprises that make up the bulk of the space sector in the UK, uh, to bring them together with government partners, with investors, uh, and that really important sharing of ideas, sparking off each other, building those connections, learning from each other. It's a very, very powerful tool and, and, a, and an event that we're super proud of in the UK. Well, I've really enjoyed what I've seen of it thus far. This is actually my first Ignite conference that I've been to. I've only been here for a few hours, but people definitely seem to be very excited about space thus far. So let's go ahead and talk um, a little bit about something that's been big in the news lately, and that is Artemis. And uh, and when I go out and talk to the man on the street, as I've done in London a couple of times, um, a lot of the response is, is there's not necessarily a great deal of, of understanding in terms of why does the taxpayer contribute? Should, should the taxpayer contribute um, to to uh, a mission to the moon, to getting man back to the moon, um, given the fact that there are so many other things that Britain needs to be focused on right now. So our new government has, has come in and has very clearly talked about the power of economic growth to, to rejuvenate the country, to, to, to build an economic future for us. But I think it's really important to remember that it's not just about short-term economics. A healthy economy is built on a, a fantastic science base from which innovations come and people come and training comes. So I think part of our mission at the UK Space Agency that we should be really proud of, and we are very proud of, is what our science and exploration missions. We contribute to a whole range of, of science missions, often through the European Space Agency. Um, but on the exploration side, um, the, the power of the innovation and the inspiration, I should say, that you get from humans going into space is is, is unrivaled. It's it's something which is good for the nation. It's good for for global the global space community. So we've signed up to the Artemis Accord, as, as you know well, for for good reasons. We believe in the power of human spaceflight and exploration. We see the logic of the the Moon to Mars journey. And we also have in the UK some really interesting niche technologies, which we believe uh, can make a real significant contribution to the Artemis mission. 
So, for example, nuclear power, which is going to be part of how you you deliver power either onto the surface of the moon and beyond. Um, so we're really proud to be part of it. We're looking forward to working with our, our colleagues across the Artemis Accord into the future. It's, it's a fundamental part of our mission in the space agency to understand our universe. And we see human spaceflight and exploration as a key part of that. Now, can you briefly explain to the viewers, you just mentioned the moon to Mars concept. Can you explain that philosophy and, and why that, just, just briefly, how that, why that's advantageous um, in terms of an idea of eventually going to Mars? So this is very much about reducing risk, proving technologies. Um, and let's be under no doubt, exploring on the moon is hard. This is hard stuff. It's a long way away. And I think you, you mentioned meeting people in the street in London. People don't really appreciate the sort of distances we're talking about, the hugely hostile environment. This is not a walk in the park. It makes Antarctica look like a really easy place to go and live and work. Um, so actually proving some of these technologies uh, in that environment as a precursor to going further just seems to make logical sense to me. Yeah, um, to me as well, actually. Um, it, it definitely reduces the risk of going to Mars. So tell me a little bit about some of the, uh, just just an overview of recent developments with the UK Space Agency. Um, the thing that I talk about so often is the fact that uh, you guys are very business and business oriented um, and, and uh, business development oriented, and you accomplish a lot with very meager funding <laughs> compared to NASA. So tell me a little bit about your recent accomplishments and, and how do you do all of this <laughs> yeah so so we do do a lot with not very much um but uh, we're, we're not an agency like nasa so we're, we're very commercially minded and one of our core purposes is to catalyze it we call it catalyzing investment so where do you put the taxpayers pound to then build confidence for others to invest and so on and we get amazing returns the, the uk part of the space economy is about five percent we're only putting a fifth of that in from the government the rest is what we're catalyzing we have one of the very, the largest venture capitalist markets in the world around space um, so it's really important to us that we we can maximize those opportunities our investment through the european space agency we get £9.8 back into the economy from every pound we put in. So this is a good bet if you're, if you're a politician looking at where you want to put your money. Putting money into space drives economic benefit for the country and growth. It's also a sector we're very proud of, of obviously how many um, highly qualified PhD students we recruit, um, people with, with further degrees and so on. Um, so compared to the rest of the economic sector in the UK, uh, a, a highly qualified one. Um, so what else from the space agency? So catalyzing investments, sort of our core mission. Um, we have a championing space mission. That's all about presenting and a, a compelling case for why space is important. And I think this has really changed in, in, in recent years. I've been in the space sector only now for a year and a bit. I had no idea before I came into the space sector, quite how reliant our society today is on space, be it precision navigation and timing for GPS, be it um, uh, precision timing for financial transactions, Earth observation data, weather forecasting. Every single one of you watching this podcast, you have used space today. In fact, you are using space now to watch this podcast. But that's a, an insidious dependency, we call it. It's, it's something that people haven't realised that they are now very dependent on space. We think about 18% of our country's GDP is fundamentally dependent on space. Imagine a day without space. Actually, even more scary, imagine the second and third day without space when you don't have access to GPS or you don't have access to ubiquitous communications where you can't make financial transactions because that's not there. This is properly scary. And actually, I think our society doesn't understand the dependency. So when we talk about national security, space is fundamental. It's no longer a thing on the side which sort of helps national security. Space is national security. And that's a really important message. So this idea of, when I say championing space, getting that message across, helping people understand and see the inspirational power of space as well as the need for it to be resilient is really, really important.
And then the third part of what we do, just to finish the story, is around actually delivering missions and capabilities, often with international partners in the European Space Agency. just makes sense for us as a smaller country. We can gear our money with 22 others, uh, and we can get a lot of bang for our British buck. Well, it's been a great pleasure speaking with you. I had a great pleasure this this relationship we've I've had uh, with the UK Space Agency. Really appreciate your time, and I look forward to seeing what's going to be happening in 2025 and the years to come. And so do we. Thank you very much.